Hello, I'm Jen Apoff Gray, founder and artistic director of Forward Theatre Company in Madison, Wisconsin. And this is Theatre Forward, a twice monthly conversation about theatre from a local, regional, and national perspective. From Madison to Manhattan, we're excited to share insight into our own company while exploring issues surrounding theatre in the Midwest and around the country. Welcome to episode 56 of Theatre Forward. For this episode, I have the pleasure of talking with most of the authors of 46 plays for America's First Ladies, the production that recently opened here at Forward Theatre that will be streaming through May 23rd. With me today are Ginevra gallo Bayades, Chloe Johnson, Bilal Dadai, and Andy Bayades. The other author on this project was Sharon Green, who unfortunately was unable to join us today. Bilal, Andy, Ginevra, Chloe, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having us. For having us. So I thought we could just start with a really um, brief little bio from each of you, just about sort of who you are as a playwright um, in your career, sort of beyond just this one project. Um, Bilal, maybe I could start with you. Uh, sure. Um, so uh, I'm, I, I do a lot of different writing, but yeah, I've uh, primarily been writing for the stage since about uh, 1995. Uh uh, and then I, I joined the Neo Futurists in Chicago in 2004 and was there until 2016. Um, and then I've just continued. And I'm currently with Lifeline Theater, which uh, which has a mission of adapting adapting literature for the stage. And uh, I've also, for the past few years, been um, heavily involved in a lot of audio um, audio drama, uh, including uh, the show Unwell, which was done by Heart Life, and a few others. So yeah, that's. Yeah, primarily scripting. That's that's me. Thank you, Chloe. How about you? Um, yeah. Uh, so my writing life. Um, so uh, like everyone here, I was a member of the Neo Futurists for a long time, um, and uh, created a number of shows with them, including the original President Show many years ago. Um, uh, and um, most of my other writing for the stage has been. Um, for myself, <laughs> solo work. Um, so when the pandemic hit, I was at work on a solo piece um, about artificial intelligence and video games and things like that, which will come back one of these days. Um, but I also write, uh, I'm also a scholar. And so I write about um, experimental theater and I'll, I write about activist performance. And I um, co-wrote a book called Ensemble Made Chicago, A Guide to Devised Theater, which is sort of a, a handbook and a history of devised theater in Chicago. Um, and uh, with, with a strong focus on kind of social justice oriented theater. Thank you. And then Andy and Ginevra, married couple, I should add, if you didn't gather that from the uh, common last name. Um, how about the two of you? You, you choose who goes first. Uh, I'll go first. So um, I think probably out of everybody in the in the playwriting team, I'm probably the person who considers myself least a playwright, or at least least officially. <laughs> I'm not sure why. <laughs> um, I I joined the neo futurists as an actor, so I came to them as an actor and a choreographer, and it was really there that I was able to lean into my writing. I'd always written, but I hadn't necessarily been a playwright per se. And I think that most of my playwriting up until um, more recently was more in that performance art ilk. Like it was certainly really influenced by the neo-futurist aesthetic. Um, Andy and I started collaborating as writers and that, I think, you know, the first collaboration was Presidents, but that one I think didn't, we weren't together at the time. And it, you know, it really did feel more like a, you know, a five person collaborative, um, but we've, been able to work on, um, you know, a, a couple of pieces with with just the two of us, um, one of which was also derailed by the pandemic, <laughs> the Lowell offering, which was supposed to be out in Massachusetts. Um, and so uh, that's, I don't know, that's, that's kind of what I've been doing. And, and given how theater is tr changing and transforming in the wake of, of the pandemic, it's difficult to know what will happen next. So it's kind of a I don't know, it's sort of like an ellipsis right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, so I'm Andy Baides and I, um, I started my theater career in, well, I guess professionally in 1999 when I joined the Neo Futurists and I was there until 2005 and created a bunch of shows there. And one of the shows that I created was 
at the time it was called 43 plays for 43 presidents. Um, and then I think one or two shows later, um, I left the Neo-Futurists and, and um, a little bit before that, I married the woman you just heard from. And we decided we wanted to like settle down and, and have a kid and, you know, make more money. And uh, that, that, that involved cutting out the whole acting and directing part of the three things that I was doing in theater. And I just stuck with the playwriting. And so I kind of rode the success of Presidents because it had sort of like a national success. Um, I kind of rode that and made a lot of connections in January, one of them um, <laughs> around the country where I, you know, uh, connected with people and, and have been able to continue to write plays. And, um, but yeah, as you never mentioned, my my favorite has recently has been our collaboration because that was that was really exciting. We didn't really know that we could tell like a story story together. We've never done that before because um, we don't only done like things like presidents where it's just a discrete collection of plays that kind of stand next to each other. It's like more like parallel play than it is actually collaborating. And so this was. Um, fun and, and yeah it's it's this play that's just kind of encased in amber that we're really excited about it's about it's about Lowell and uh, Merrimack Rep and Lowell is 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 supposed to premiere it it was one week before premiere when it was uh, shut down yeah you know it's uh, I'm I wouldn't say I'm glad but I'm not surprised that several of you brought up uh, the ways in which COVID has just really derailed so many plans um, over the last year plus in, in the theater. And I know that was certainly the case with uh, First Ladies as well. I mean, uh, the the plan sort of all along was that we were one of multiple companies uh, involved in the sort of rolling world premiere. Um, and our, our production was going to happen in November of 2020. And we pushed it to May of 21, just to give it a a better shot at, at a live production. Um, but but where do things stand, uh, you know, in terms of the development of this new piece? And I know that there was uh, the um, the online sort of Zoom theater version done at the Neo Futurists uh, last fall as well. So I just sort of love to talk about where you think this piece is now in terms of its developmental journey, what's, what's come and, and what hopefully lies ahead for it. Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, and, and we don't know is the, is the short answer. Um, it had been, the plan was, uh, you were one of six productions that were gonna roll the premiere. Everybody else postponed indefinitely. Um, you know, I think we've got a good shot at another couple of them happening. If, you know, um, the production that was planned in Atlanta, I think probably will still happen, um, would be my hunch. Um, and you know, play scripts, uh, the, which is the, the place that, um, the publisher that published the president's script is expressed interest initially before the pandemic in publishing first lady. So we've been assuming that that's where it's going to land. And then when it lands, when it lands there, hopefully lots of other people will know about it and we'll start to see some school productions and things like that. But, you know, I, I would also say, I think that this, obviously the, the production was affected by the pandemic as everything has been affected by the pandemic. But um, I think, and I, I, you know, I'd be interested to hear Bilal and, and Jennifer and Andy weigh in on this too, but also the script was profoundly impacted by the social uprisings last summer. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think this, this, it, we, we always had at the heart of this project, um, you know, a radical reimagining of the way we tell history um, and then the, the, the need for that and the challenges of that <laughs> became all the more um, present, uh, you know, given, given all of the events of last summer and, and the conversations opened up in these ways that were just exciting and hard. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's hard to imagine what the show would have been without the pandemic and also without the, the uprisings of last summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I would, I would say, I would say that that's been a consistent theme for us developing this, you know, in from 2016 on, uh, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, as, as I'm, I know, I know we've discussed this before, but like, you know, when we initially, you know, set out to do this, we were expecting to end the show with the first woman president, mm -hmm. um, and that obviously went in a, went a very different way, and. You know, and for the next, you know, for the, you know, and it's been so it's been five years 
uh, since since that initial idea. Um, and so, you know, I think in that time, you know, we've you know, in 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 ways we've had to we first of all had to respond to that election, but I think we also had to respond to things like um, to things like the way uh, uh, migrants have been treated in the past. You know, like that, like the, the the like our discussion of that like fed directly into our discussion of how natives were treated here. And I, I think there are probably bits of of our reckoning uh, with with me too that are. Part of this, because that is also a you know a, a key a key thing here in how this role exists and how America exists around the the role of women in society. Um, so yeah, I, I think we just have to keep responding to it, and I can I can feel us having to to keep doing that the more we develop it because we're constantly shifting, especially now. Sure. Well, so when this show debuted last fall uh, with the Neo Futurists, it was a, a, a Zoom theater style production. What was that process like uh, for all of you to sort of adapt this very brand new play to that kind of a format? And and in what ways do you think that influenced um, the stage version that that we just debuted here in Madison? Um, I think in some ways translating it into film it really seemed to vary lady to lady, you know, like um, uh, play to play or playlet to playlet, I guess, where some of them translated to film really easily and it was easy to think of a way to shift the imagery or shift the activity so that we could think about them in discrete, you know, discrete locations since all the actors would inevitably be filming separately from each other. Um, and then some of them were really difficult. And I think, as, at least for my chunk of, of people, I felt like some of those translations worked really well and some of them did not. <laughs> you know, some of them I was like, oh, if I had, had more time to think about it, maybe I would have tried it like this. Um, I felt like just for me personally, it was a gift to be able to get back to the stage version. I really appreciated the opportunity to, to premiere it as a video. And I really appreciated the support and the creativity and the commitment of and the, the courage. Theaters, the courage, oh my gosh, like, yeah like mm -hmm. such brave risk taking and really like a group of people who were all just game to throw themselves in and give it everything. Um, but because it was originally conceived as a staged play and because that's how those plays initially came out, in some ways it felt like coming full circle and being able to return to home base, I guess, you know, like being able to return back to that familiar right. spot and take everything we learned from the neo-futurist development process, which was really helpful in terms of some of those conversations that, that Chloe and Bilal were alluding to, because there was so much happening on a social and uh, racial justice kind of level that we inevitably had to rethink a lot of the script. We had focused really clearly on the patriarchy, but not necessarily on white supremacy or, um, you know, the ways in which uh, colonialism kind of floats through our history quite strongly. So it gave us an opportunity to work with a group of artists who could help us rethink a lot of those pieces and add in more threads. But then being able to collaborate with you all took all of that knowledge and then let us put it back into stage format, which was really incredible. I, I just felt like that was like, you know, a really beautiful way to move it forward. I will say though, that, I mean, cause I, I read very early drafts of, of this piece long before 2020. And, and I think those threads were really clearly there already. I mean, the, the way that, um, that you collectively increased the, uh, the presence of the stories that have been typically tucked under, um, you know, under a bushel, under a blanket in our, in our telling of our history has really been pretty present from from the beginning of of telling this story and and not just focusing on the untold stories of women but all of the levels of um conflict and complicity and and um complexity throughout their stories but but yeah but I could also see re seeing the versions as they came how how much clearer the storytelling became mm -hmm. as you as you developed it yeah how has working on on the stories of these um, of these women impacted you? Like, have there been personally lessons from the lives of certain first ladies that really stuck with you? Um, that really 
linger in your mind? Um, I, I've always been really struck by uh, the first ladies who were way ahead of their time um, as feminists, um, maybe even before the word existed. Um, and um, just, just, you know, seeing, seeing like a woman in the 1850s, for example, who seems like somebody I might know today, straining against 19th century male dominated society. Um, those folks I admire so greatly. Um, and they're the ones that, that stick out in my mind. Um, um, and, and they're, you know, even some of them are not perfect, <laughs> right? They have, they have other things about them that are, that are maybe not so admirable, but, um, you know, like Lucretia Garfield and Harding were two that I covered that I, you know, in the, in reading about it, it's just, you're just so impressed that they, that they were able to, um, exert that much influence, um, at that time, you know, in, in, in various ways, you know, each in their own way. For, for me, uh, the, the ones that stick with me were actually not, uh, not ones that I did the research and the writing on. Um, the two for me who continue to stick out for me are, are Harriet Lane and Lou Hoover. Um, Harriet Lane, James Buchanan's foster daughter, step, I, I can't remember the relationship, but uh, uh, specifically because, uh, because both of them were so dynamic and so skilled and so talented and also so completely obscured by history. Mm -hmm. And, and I think the two of them especially are, are prime examples of, of phenomenal women who were obscured by their association with deeply mediocre men. <laughs> and that is, and, and knowing that that, that that occurred at the highest level of American life, like, you can you can understand exactly how many more women without that level of of visibility like were also lost and it's it's maddening i think i think for me um and, and it's it's funny because it's sort of the foil to andy's answer um lucy hayes just I, I deeply fell in love with Lucy Hayes. And I think it's because she was a reminder to me at the time that we were writing this that it, the, that you don't always know what ripples you're creating in your life. Mm -hmm. And living with integrity and living with authenticity and living with intention, you know, all by itself is extremely important and is is worthwhile even if you don't know where any of that's going to lead the the fact that you are choosing to live that way is the important part um and so i felt like that was just one of those you know she was sort of the one of these unexpected teachers that i came across in in the research and she really stuck with me the whole time chloe do you have one I'm so stuck on them. <laughs> I mean, I, I definitely um, would have said Harry. I mean, I think Harriet Lane is such a revelation in part because the play is so gorgeous. Um, and I think what Sharon, that's Sharon's play and what she's done so beautifully is offer, you know, a, a, a queer retelling of history, like sort of arguing for this as a, as a queer family. Um, and, uh, and, and recognizing it as such, makes us kind of rethink families in a, in a broader sense. Um, but yeah, just, just this idea. I, I think part of also what's so compelling about Harriet Lane is that she's one of the rare instances of somebody, you know, as Sharon writes, like she was essentially raised for the job. Like she was mm -hmm. actually qualified and prepared for it. And it turns out that like, you're going to be better at that job if you, <laughs> as opposed to somebody like, um, you know, uh, Oh gosh, I'm blanking Andy. I'm Pierce's first name, but poor Jane. Jane. Jane, poor Jane Pierce, right? It gets kind of dragged into this. Um so yeah, I mean, I think I, I that I think about that 
uh, that story a lot. Um, and the sort of the material accomplishments of Harriet Lane as well, um, founding the, um, the, the hospital at Johns Hopkins to essentially address the very disease that killed her children or her child, I can't remember now. Um, anyway, so I, I, yeah, that one stays with me a lot. And, and I also, um, I, I, the people that stay with me too are the people that are like caught in the middle of, like, I don't know how to feel about them at all. Like mm -hmm. Dolly Madison is somebody who, you know, really could have been president in her own right. And mm -hmm. also she owned slaves. And how do we reconcile, like, you know, wanting her to be this feminist icon with, you know, committing that kind of atrocity. Um, you know, Julia Grant is another one who right. was probably, you know, a huge part of the reason why Ulysses S. Grant was president. And, and again, you know, we run into these. So it's, it's the, it's the ones that leave me with very, um, very conflicted feelings that, um, or, or not even conflicted, actually, <laughs> negative feelings, you know, look, looking for those, looking for those Sometimes you look for a feminist icon and you, and you, they're not there. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. What makes me think of that really terrific line in the uh, hilariously funny Nancy Reagan play where it's just, aren't all women who wield power feminists, not just ones you agree with. And it's like, it's mm -hmm. okay to say no, you know, yeah. I really, um, that, that resonates with me a lot. Well, you know, it's, this is certainly the case for me when I first started reading the earlier drafts of this, and I've already heard, I mean, we just opened a few days ago as we're recording this, and I'm already hearing from audience members who, you know, are watching this, loving it, and then immediately turning to Google because they uh -huh. want to learn more, you know, the Harriet Lanes of the world, um, the Jane Pierces, the Lucretia Garfield, like, why don't we know more about these women? Why aren't we hearing about this in our in our history textbooks and in, in class? And and um, and that's a pretty cool takeaway from a piece of theater where where people are so hungry to to hear these stories they haven't heard before uh, that that they then go out and um, and do a little digging on their own. That's a pretty great legacy from this piece that talks a lot about legacy. Mm -hmm. It's it's pretty great. Um, well, I think we can say that that's it for this episode of Theater Forward. I'm so grateful to all four of you for joining us. Um, this has been a conversation about theater in Wisconsin, the Midwest, and America. Thanks to all of you listening for joining us. I'm Jenna Puff Gray. Our podcast is produced by Scott Hayden, and you can follow us or share your thoughts on Facebook and Twitter at Theater Forward, as always, with an E-R. If you enjoy, enjoyed this podcast, please don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform and leave us a review. We are so grateful to have you listening and we will be back soon for another Theater Forward conversation.